My apologies for uh, us having to resort to recording these videos uh, rather than doing the interview live as we had attempted. As you might be aware, there are repeated power outages uh, in Lebanon, uh, usually, but they have been greatly exacerbated in the recent uh, crisis situation, and we have been unable to maintain an internet connection long enough to actually conduct the interview. You might be aware that Lebanon had been celebrated for many months as a successful case study in terms of containing the spread of the coronavirus relative to other countries, both in the region and around the world. In fact, according to the Ministry of Public Health, as of July 10th, there has been a total cumulative number of positive cases equal to 2,082. When you compare that to a population of Lebanon of approximately 6 million people, which includes Lebanese citizens, uh, refugee populations, primarily Syrian, but also Palestinian, as well as uh, migrant uh, laborers from various uh, parts of South Asia and Southeast Asia, you can appreciate why some people would consider Lebanon a success case. In addition, there has been a total of 36 COVID-19 related deaths in Lebanon since the first case was reported on February 21st, 2020. However, this success case or successful narrative, I think needs to be challenged on two fronts. First and foremost, and something we'll get into later on, is the fact that while the spread of the coronavirus might have been contained thus far, the socioeconomic effects uh, during the pandemic have been devastating to people's everyday lives. These socioeconomic effects uh, were the result primarily of pre-existing crises that were exacerbated by the pandemic and responses to the pandemic. So we've seen dramatic increases in unemployment, dramatic increases in poverty rates, uh, dramatic decreases in purchasing power, uh, and uh, the accompanying socioeconomic dislocation has been very hard on the average person living in Lebanon, whether Lebanese or non-Lebanese. I'd also like to note that we are actually appearing to be on a turning point here in Lebanon with regards to the coronavirus. Um, the last two days have featured record-setting single-day increases. In fact, the last 24 hours featured 71 new confirmed positive cases, which is the new record for a daily increase, and it is new relative to the record that was set just the 24-hour period before then, in which 66 new cases were reported, right? So what we're seeing now in Lebanon this week might be the largest weekly increase we've seen in the country since the first case was reported on February 21st. I think this continuing trend is going to challenge the success narrative, uh, both locally, regionally, and internationally. Now, uh, according to experts that are following this situation closely, the recent spikes uh, are both the result of the spreading of the coronavirus locally, but also uh, the opening up of the airport and the influx of travelers who might be or are positive with the coronavirus. Uh, we are also seeing a rise in the number and size of coronavirus clusters in different parts of the country and in new parts of the country where it was not previously seen. And one of the new challenges that I believe the Ministry of Public Health and public health and private health officials are dealing with in general is finding greater difficulty in being able to trace these entire clusters and their origins. And as you might be aware, if you're unable to trace the origins of the cluster and where it has spread to, then it's difficult to identify the entire cluster and contain it. So by all accounts, uh, most people are expecting to see a dramatic increase in the number of coronavirus cases in the coming weeks and months here in Lebanon at the same time that uh, uh, the country is opening up, so to speak, uh, in relation to its previous lockdown, and at the same time that we are witnessing more and more hospitals reporting shortages of electricity, 
uh, inability to properly attend to their patients, and an increasing number of public health staff reporting as having contracted the coronavirus themselves. So at the same time that we're seeing an increasing in the number of cases and in the geographic spread of the cases, we are seeing that the capacity of the Lebanese health sector to actually contain or address the coronavirus is actually either decreasing or has been revealed to be less than it was previously. Well, I alluded to some of these measures when I was trying to describe the current situation of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic here. Uh, just as a refresher, you know, the first case of coronavirus in Lebanon was confirmed on February 21st, 2020, and it was on March 10th that the first death was uh, confirmed. Now, um, perhaps the most immediate and effective measure the government had taken was to shut down the country uh, sequentially, but eventually culminating in a, a, a total lockdown, if you will. On February 29th, all private and public schools from kindergarten through the university systems were closed. On March 6, uh, gyms, cinemas, theaters, bars, and nightclubs were closed down. On March 11th, restaurants. And then on March 18th, there was a shutdown of the land, air, and sea borders uh, of the country, and most notably, of course, Rafiq Hariri International Airport in Beirut. Uh, I believe that this uh, total shutdown was largely responsible for containing uh, the spread of the coronavirus in Lebanon, even if we should cast uh, reasonable skepticism of the accuracy of the numbers that we've seen so far from the Ministry of Public Health, either due to lack of self-reporting or breakdown in the reporting and communication uh, mechanism. However, as I alluded to earlier, the biggest uh, uh, and most important challenge that the government failed to meet was to actually provide a set of social safety nets during the lockdown to uh, prevent uh, the population reaching what uh, the uh, director of uh, one of the leading uh, public hospitals in Lebanon has called lockdown fatigue. In fact, uh, uh, the shutting down of schools of gyms, cinemas, restaurants, the airport, and so on and so forth, on top of a pre-existing uh, socioeconomic crisis in Lebanon has devastated and ravaged uh, the economy with no uh, support from the government. There were small measures designed to support the most vulnerable of the population, a term that was subject to rife debate within the government and rife debate within the distribution mechanism of a one-time payment or, or a payment over a number of months, but certainly nothing that could compensate for the socioeconomic dislocation that accompanied this kind of uh, uh, shutdown. Uh, on top of this socioeconomic uh, dislocation, we have had uh, since May 4th, the gradual reopening of the country. Uh, so while schools remain closed, we've seen restaurants, uh, cinemas, gyms, theaters, malls gradually reopen. There are different policies in place for mask wearing, for checking temperatures, for social distancing within these places of business. Um, in large part, they are not being followed uh, either by the customers or by many of the business owners. Um, and on July 1st, uh, we saw the reopening of the Beirut International Airport. Uh, these two dynamics, the reopening of the country internally and the influx of uh, travelers from outside of the country uh, are a big part of what is leading to the resurgence of the coronavirus here in Lebanon. Um, and as we discussed earlier, as a result of the local spread of the coronavirus and the influx of international travelers who have tested positive. Um, I should just point out that of the 2,082 cases that tested positive here in Lebanon, uh, according to the Ministry of Public Health, 1,440 of them contracted uh, the coronavirus locally, and 642 
uh, individuals contracted the coronavirus outside of the country and then proceeded to enter the country. Um, so we have to keep these issues in mind as we start to see the uh, uh, increasing numbers uh, with regards to the coronavirus. There happens to also be a major political crisis on top of the socioeconomic crisis. The idea of a lockdown is very uh, politically unpalatable for the current government and for many political parties. Um, and so it is highly doubtful that the government and leading politicians of the major political parties will actually support uh, a return to the lockdown anytime soon. And in fact, in my opinion and the opinion of um, activists on the ground and people who live and work in Lebanon and follow things much more closely than I, part of the political motivation for such a rapid uh, uh, employment of the lockdown policy back in February and March was also that the country was facing unprecedented uh, uh, protest movements in different parts of the countries, in different cities, uh, against all the major political parties. And so at that point, there was actual a political incentive to lock down the country. And I believe that is why the country's uh, governing elites responded so quickly. Right now, there is no political incentive. In fact, there's a political disincentive to lock down the country at the same time that we are starting to see a resurgence in the coronavirus, which is something that is very concerning for many people who live here. As I've said in, in other talks and interviews that I've given, we can think of the current situation in Lebanon as featuring a series of overlapping crises. Uh, for the purposes of this interview, I'm just going to highlight four immediate ones. The first is a developmental crisis where the development model that uh, Lebanon has pursued has uh, come to a grinding halt. Uh, revenue generation in the country has effectively ceased and the distribution of revenue as it was being generated throughout the last 30 years has been a very uneven and unequal distribution. We have an economy that has been largely reliant on the service sector. Uh, it has not been reliant enough or made adequate advances to cultivate a productive sector such as the manufacturing sector or the agricultural sector, which tend to be the more uh, 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 labor-intensive sectors. Uh, and so uh, what we have in Lebanon is a development model that has largely relied on the service sector that has not created enough jobs and in which the revenue that has been generated has largely accumulated to a very small percentage of the population. Nevertheless, this development model has effectively come to a grinding halt because of a number of political and economic uh, factors. There is also a fiscal crisis in the country, meaning that the government simply does not have enough revenues to pay for its commitments either towards the population, uh, towards running government services, uh, government offices, uh, salaries and pensions, or even to service its debt, which is why, of course, the Lebanese government very recently defaulted on its eurobond payments. Uh, I also think we have to be cognizant that there is a foreign currency crisis here in uh, Lebanon. This was a dollarized economy where the US dollar and the Lebanese lira were interchangeable at a fixed rate. Uh, people had uh, bank accounts in dollars, people could pay in dollars, people got paid in dollars, as well as Lebanese liras. This system has also come to a complete stop. There is a massive shortage of US dollars in this country at the same time that people have been blocked by the banks from accessing their dollar deposits. Uh, simultaneously with this currency crisis, you have the plummeting of the Lebanese lira. So um, approximately one year ago, the Lebanese uh, uh, lira uh, in relation to the dollar was one US dollar equaled approximately 1,500 Lebanese lira. About 10 days ago, you could exchange one US dollars for approximately 9,000 Lebanese liras. So you are talking about a uh, more than five-fold uh, increase uh, in the uh, plummeting uh, of the value of the lira 
expected by uh, next month. This has been devastating to the purchasing power uh, of the average person in the country, especially in an economy that is hugely reliant on imports, not just for luxury goods, but also for basic goods. So this currency crisis and the fiscal crisis uh, largely help us understand the fact that there is a, a fuel shortage in the country and that as a result of the fuel shortage, there has been a greater electricity shortage in the country at the same time that the summer months are kicking in. People who have access to air conditioning tend to want to use air conditioning much more frequently. And this helps us understand this fourth crisis that uh, uh, is important that is going on in Lebanon, which is the infrastructural crisis. Whether it's electricity, whether it's water, whether it's uh, transportation, whether it's internet, uh, these various public utilities, these various infrastructures that are necessary, not just for the functioning of an economy, but for some semblance of the functioning of everyday life for people have come to one way or another a grinding halt. In fact, um, the internet service in this country has dramatically decreased in quality over the last few weeks. This is on top of, of course, the notoriously uh, poorly managed electricity sector. To give you an example, in Beirut specifically, Historically, the last uh, decade or more, there has been approximately three hours of electricity outages per day. Um, in the last week alone, many parts of Beirut, including uh, the more affluent neighborhoods, have experienced uh, power cuts upwards of 20 hours a day. Now, for people who have access to building or neighborhood generators, they are usually able to compensate for the breakdown of government-provided electricity. But when you have a fuel shortage occurring at the same time, even local neighborhood and building generators are unable to secure enough fuel to provide electricity in the absence of government electricity. So I think it's really important to understand that what we're seeing in Lebanon is a developmental crisis, a fiscal crisis, a currency crisis, and an infrastructural crisis. And to get to your point, about whether these were avo avoidable, these are absolutely avoidable crises. And these are largely homegrown crises. They are the direct result of policies implemented by the leading political parties in this country and leading politicians in this country since the end of the Civil War uh, in the early 1990s through today. And in fact, the worsening of this socioeconomic crisis and these overlapping crises is a function of the unwillingness of these political parties to take any meaningful measures to address the crises. You might be familiar with the fact that there was an attempt to negotiate with the International Monetary Fund uh, and that the International Monetary Fund had set certain conditions for negotiations to begin and then certain conditions to be able to provide uh, the government of Lebanon with financing. Um, the Lebanese government and the political parties that uh, uh, have held it up have been unwilling to make those concessions and therefore the talks have broken down. Uh, it's quite ironic to be in a situation where it appears to someone like me that the International Monetary Fund is being the rational uh, 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 social justice oriented party in a set of negotiations about the future of the economics in Lebanon. But I think that demonstrates to you not how benevolent or good the IMF is. In fact, we know its record around the world, but how right wing and intransigent the political elites in this country, in Lebanon, are with regards to the status quo and their unwillingness to address anything that either cuts in the way of their profits or undermines their political power. And I think we've reached a point in this country where we are seeing poverty rates uh, well over 50%, unemployment rates well over 30 percent. These are statistics that the government itself is admitting to, which only tells us that the situation is far more dire uh, in Lebanon. And what makes it difficult compared to many other times here in the country 
is the fact that this is happening at a time where you have the COVID-19 global pandemic, where you have economic fluctuations and crises occurring in multiple other countries in the region and around the world, including the United States and Europe. Therefore, the idea that some country or set of countries is going to be able to bail out the Lebanese elite like it has in the past is increasingly looking unlikely to many of us that follow politics and developments here. However, we should also note that, going back to your point about whether the current crises were avoidable, that these crises were both made here locally by the local political elites with the full backing of parties like the United States, uh, the European Union, the International Monetary Fund, uh, f the French government, uh, the World Bank, and even the United Nations Development Program, not to mention uh, uh, parties that have been lesser involved in the overall structure and shaping of the Lebanese political economy since the Civil War, like Iran uh, and the Syrian regime. So um, we, we have a very dire situation here. And um, what we need to see from these political elites is something they are both unwilling and incapable of providing for the majority of the people who live in this country who are increasingly suffering every day. I think we can talk about uh, increasing rates of poverty, increasing rates of unemployment, and decreasing uh, purchasing power. Uh, allow me to give you some examples. Um, according to one estimate, there have been over 900 uh, establishments in terms of hotels, cafes, and restaurants that have closed down in recent months, accompanied with the laying off of over 25,000 workers. And here we are just talking about the hospitality industry. We are not talking about any other type of economic sector. So we can only imagine the great socioeconomic dislocation that is happening. At the same time, people are increasingly unable not only to make ends meet, but to afford what is available in the country. So, uh, for example, there has been a number of studies on the cost of living in Lebanon. And we have seen that the cost of basic food items, uh, ranging from things like rice, sugar, lentils, uh, fava beans, and other items have increased anywhere from 30% to 80% uh, in their prices. And remember that this is happening at the same time that less people are employed, and many of those that have remained employed have actually had to take salary cuts. Uh, we are seeing uh, prices in uh, uh, the supermarkets and in the pharmacies skyrocket. Um, for example, diapers that are imported have almost doubled in price. Um, we are seeing uh, other uh, basic goods. And remember, right now we are not talking about any types of luxury goods. I am speaking specifically about basic goods and the goods that are important and necessary for families to be able to sustain themselves. We are starting to see reports of people who are showing pictures of their refrigerator on social media, of, of people who are trying to barter with some of the uh, material goods that they have in exchange, if not for cash, then for actual goods such as diapers uh, and, and basic foods. Um, we are seeing an increase in the number of panhandlers outside of people asking for assistance and for help in some of the more affluent commercial areas. Um, at the same time that there is a small number of people in Lebanon that are continuing to go out to consume at restaurants uh, and at bars uh, and at resorts uh, as business as usual, which I think reflects the class divide in this country and the fact that um, you know what's happening in Lebanon is devastating to the entire country but it's affecting people very differently um, and I just want to go back to when the government itself is acknowledging a poverty rate of 50 percent or higher and an unemployment rate of 30 percent of higher you have to anticipate that things are dramatically worse for everyday people here in the country.
It's a little hard for me to respond to the question of is there going to be another civil war or is there going to be another uh, war by Israel on Lebanon in large part because uh, I'm hesitant to make predictions um, because I tend to think most people who do that don't do it well, but also because I'm not necessarily going to be the person who's going to be most affected by the consequences should those predictions come true or not true. Uh, however, I will say that in Lebanon, I think a reality of everyday life is what uh, one scholar has called the constant anticipation of violence, either in the form of civil war or in the form of uh, an Israeli invasion or bombardment or other form of military aggression on the country. So um, less important is whether I think a civil war is coming or whether I think there's going to be a war by Israel on the country this summer or in the near future. What is more important is that it is a palpable uh, a constant anticipation on the part of many people who live in Lebanon, which only adds to the intensity uh, of the dislocation that is being experienced at the political, economic, and social levels here in the country. Um, I will say that uh, there are people who are planning uh, to try and leave the country in anticipation of war. Uh, there are other people who are planning to prepare themselves to remain here in, in the advent of war. Uh, but I think we have to, as perhaps analysts, uh, move away from war as the framework of worst case scenario, not because war is not that bad. In fact, the experience of war in Lebanon has been devastating, both the locally uh, uh, created and homegrown uh, wars, as well as the wars by uh, external powers, most notably Israel. Um, but what I do think is important to note is that we are seeing a type of socioeconomic dislocation, the likes of which it has been some time uh, that the people who live in Lebanon have not seen. Uh, the constraints and ability to overcome are, are, are much tighter than has previously been the case. And so rather than using war as the metric of the worst possible scenario, let us suspend that uh, attempt at predicting matters and let us just take into serious consideration that the type of socioeconomic dislocation that is occurring right now is devastating to the majority of the people, particularly from the middle class, the working class, and below in the rural regions in particular, but also the urban areas. Um, and I think that's what we need to keep focusing on, because even should a war happen or not happen, it is this socioeconomic structure that is in place that is at the root cause of the current types of dislocation and, and, and suffering that people here in Lebanon are facing.